Good morning, and welcome to our virtual 44th annual conference, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. Fulbright at 75, celebrating a legacy of global friendships. My name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of your Fulbright Association. I'm honored to kick off this three-day online gathering of diverse and talented Fulbrighters with a fascinating panel that I will moderate called Fulbrighters Reaching Out Across the World. Before I introduce our seven panelists, I want to thank several people for the success of this annual conference. My colleague Munir Sayeh has produced this conference. Rob Lively was the program chair of a very hardworking committee. Joe Vitone organized the virtual art exhibit. Alice Blumenfeld chaired the Selma Jean Cohen selection. And Dee Dee Long chairs our national board. I also want to thank our generous sponsors, Rice University, the Cinema and Media Studies Program at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Alabama, Auburn University, the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, the National Peace Corps Association, and former board president Manfred Philip for funding the Young Professional Scholarship. Thank you, Fred. We are grateful to all of them and to you, our members and friends, for supporting the FA mission of education, advocacy, and community service. Now to our opening session of Fulbrighters. Dr. Alex Akuli will discuss the role of Fulbright alumni in K-12 international ed education. Jesse Appel, a comedian, will speak on exchange in the age of the internet. A panel led by Dr. Angela Ford including Drs. Tara Wilfong, Daniel Alamne, and Aris Kidane, excuse me, will focus our, on friendships in an Ethiopian cohort. And finally, Julia Roberts will present on change makers in Lao PDR. Our speakers will give their presentations consecutively, followed by a 20 to 25 minute time period for your questions. Please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions at any time, stating the name of the presenter to whom you're asking the question. I'll share as many questions as time allows. And now I'll ask, I'll ask Alex to begin his talk. Alex? Thank you, John. Good morning, all. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, it's a privilege to be with you all this morning and share a few perspectives on how Fulbright alumni can serve as conduit for creating sustainable international education exchanges at K-12 schools. And my perspectives come to you as a case example from South Carolina uh, in collaboration with our partners in, uh, uh, in Germany. So the first, the problem statement, international education and exchange programs are non-existent at most K-12 schools, primarily due to a lack of resources, be that financial, staffing, and our expertise. Consequently, millions of students progress through the K-12 curriculum, deprived and unaware of international education opportunities and potential benefits for the individual, their community, and their country. Now, these observations are not unique to South Carolina. These are across the United States and most of the world as well. Um, for context, the case example here uh, happens between schools uh, in South Carolina, the upstate region in particular, uh, I'm located in Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, partner schools in Bavaria, Germany, Lanzut, uh, the city of Lanzut in particular. So the framework uh, includes eight public school districts and one regional university, public university in rural South Carolina. In 2018, I've, I, uh, designed and uh, facilitated signing a formal memorandum of understanding between the university where I used to work and the eight school districts, as well as one applied science university and two high schools uh, in Germany. The university and the high schools in Germany do not have a formal agreement as in the case of South Carolina. So the results that I want to share with you today are what came as a result of this work, uh, I created an international professional development program for K-12 teachers and administrators that uh, I had two faculty colleagues lead 
uh, in 2018 and 2019. Additionally, three K-12 sister school agreements were established during the same period, 2018, 2019, and four K-12 exchange programs, primarily high school uh, exchange programs were delivered, developed and delivered in 2018 and 2019. All of this progress came to fruition through strategic uh, partnership and support from community organizations. So on the upper left corner of the screen, my screen, hopefully that's how it shows on your end, um, is the Bavarian Minister, Minister of Education, as well as the university president uh, in Germany, in Landshut. Partners here include the Hochschule Landshut, which is the University of Applied Science in Landshut, Guta Institute that provided support for the high school uh, at District 2 in Spartanburg, the German American Club of the Carolinas, where I also serve as a board member, University of South Carolina Upstate, the city of Greer, where I live. Uh, the mayor uh, of Greer has hosted numerous groups uh, from abroad. In particular, here we have a group of university students uh, who came on a study abroad tour. The German American Club and the Sister Cities International, where I serve as vice president, um, hosted community engagement and uh, friendship uh, luncheons, as we can see here, a picnic. So this is just to show that uh, strategic and community partners are key to making this kind of progress. So I want to share with you a quick success story from District 2, and I am uh, referring here as chronologically. District 2 in uh, is a rural, uh, school district in upstate South Carolina. And here we have a picture of 20 uh, high school students from Germany with their teachers being welcomed at the Charlotte, North Carolina airport by the principal of the high school, William Springs High School, teachers as well as families and students from the high school receiving the students from Germany who stayed in uh, ho with host families during a two week period learning experience. Following this first visit uh, from, the from the students, Boiling Springs High School then also sent a group of their students in the, sub in the fall of 2018 uh, as part of the exchange program. In 2019, uh, Spartanburg District 1 uh, received their first small group of students and two teachers uh, for a two week immersion experience as well. Again, the program is housed through host families, uh, particularly families of students who attend the same high schools. In this case, Spartanburg District 1 district, uh, school district also includes the high school and a career training center. What also came to fruition during this collaborative approach was that the university in Germany, for the first time, started to develop their own faculty-led study abroad programs which are very common and very popular from you know, in the United States case, but not nearly as popular uh, and as, as successful from the European side. So we had two uh, programs, one from the School of Social Work. And in this case, in this picture, we have the group from the high school as well as the university. And the university group was from computer science and automotive software engineering. Moving forward, the Fulbright Association of South Carolina, our chapter here, is working uh, dil diligently to bring uh, Fulbright learning experiences in the classroom and currently through virtual learning. We did this type of engagement uh, last spring. It was very well received, which then led to additional schools expressing interest in working with us to uh, tap into our network of colleagues across the world to establish sister schools. Uh, relationships. In particular, we have a case that we're working on right now in uh, Central America. So this is the framework through which I bring this, these perspectives uh, and the prerequisites for success in this case are visionary, collaborative, and participatory leadership, international strategic partnerships, teacher and staff buy-in and ownership, achievable goals that uh, encourage and promote continued growth, as well as support from school administrators and local partners. I will pause here to allow time for uh, questions uh, and discussion uh, towards the end of our session. So I will stop sharing my screen here.
Thank you for your attention. And I hand this off to Jesse. Thank you all. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesse Appel. Thank you, Dr. Akuli, for that presentation. I'm so glad to be able to be joining with all of my fellow Fulbrighters here and to be able to share a topic which is uh, very important to me, and it's been my life for the last eight years since I got my Fulbright Fellowship, and that is people-to-people -people diplomacy now, thanks to COVID and thanks to the internet, online. Um, so if everybody can see my, uh, my screen here, we're going good. Go to slideshow. Um, I wanted to uh, share a little bit about my experience. I was a Fulbright Scholar in China in 2012 to 2013, and I researched a type of traditional Chinese comedy called Xiangsheng. So I would go on stage and perform, and my uh, Fulbright project was apprenticing to this man on the screen, Master Ding Guangquan, to learn how to do traditional Chinese comedy. And this turned into essentially a whole career performing comedy in China. Uh, over the last eight years before the pandemic, I did stand up in Chinese on Chinese TV shows and would also make internet videos sharing about American culture in China and also sharing about Chinese culture in uh, the United States on the Western internet. Um, and this has really brought me to an understanding about how the nature of our people to people exchange is, uh, it's not necessarily morphing, but it's adding an element of the internet. And I'd be happy to share my experience. And hopefully this can be um, illuminating for some of you as well to see how you can add an internet element into whatever it is that you do between people to people work. Uh, so the story that I wanna share is actually what happened immediately after COVID. Uh, I had been living in China for eight years and I happened to be back in America for what I thought was a nine day vacation in January of 2020. Uh, you know, almost two years later, I'm still back here because the borders are still closed. But the uh, initial uh, the initial COVID outbreak hit very hard in China, and there was a time when we could still do shows here in the states, uh, but people in China really needed help. And so I put together a charity show at my high school auditorium in Newton, Massachusetts, and we sold out the theater. And I did a comedy show based off of funny videos that I saw on the internet of Chinese people going through quarantine, which at the time, if you'd remember, there were some very funny videos that came out of it that people in America had no context for. And uh, this charity show, we wound up raising $12,000 and donating supplies over to uh, Wuhan. Uh, we also, I also filmed that show and put it on my internet channels and it went mega, mega viral. Uh, the video got um, many hundreds of millions of hits. I think it was about 400 million hits. And it was the, I believe to be the only video in the history of the world that was shared by both NPR and the Chinese police. Um, so for people who think that we can't use people to people to bring together strange bedfellows, um, this might be the strangest of bedfellows ever. Um, but it got me thinking about why the internet was so effective at uh, people to people uh, diplomacy and people to people exchange. And really from our perspective as the people that got a chance to do this in person, we sometimes miss the big context, which is that most Chinese will never visit America. I'm speaking of China, but this is true of basically every country. Most Americans uh, will never visit China. And so our interactions online for most people in the world who are not academics in an international communication will be the entirety of how we interact as people to people in the world. And so if you have a personal connection to another country, we all know this from our experience abroad, you become a cultural ambassador, but the truth is that extends onto the internet as well. And so I have a couple ideas that I've learned about how to be effective and responsible cultural ambassadors online. Uh, and I, uh, I originally have been thinking about how to do this well by going back to the very beginning of the US-China people-to-people exchange, uh, especially in this time when US and China relations are so bad, I thought, what, what started us off on a good spot? And uh, what I realized what it was is the ping pong diplomacy, the very uh, opening salvo of the American ping pong team going to China and uh, being able to interact with the Chinese ping pong team. This didn't obviously open the borders by itself, but it created an environment in which positive change could happen. And so I thought, why did it work? Uh, and I think it worked for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the idea is simple to understand and accessible. They chose ping pong. They didn't choose a symphony orchestra. They didn't choose equestrian. 
him. They picked the things that regular people were doing. And that allowed the leaders of the country, even though they were interacting as diplomats, to interact with each other as regular people. Uh, and second, the attempt uh, to do good people-to-people -people diplomacy happens in good faith. It really doesn't matter who wins the ping pong game. Uh, similarly, in many of your projects, it may not even matter whether your project succeeds. The very attempt at having made the connection can be what is effective, especially on the internet. And then fin and finally, it's fun. Uh, you know, people are having you know a lot of trouble right now in the international sphere. Be reminded that we originally we go to other countries and we meet other people because it's fun is a useful thing to keep in touch. This allows us to have our big ideas on intercultural cooperation manifest themselves as real life friendships. And those friendships are the things that are going to stabilize the international cooperation in times of tension. So that was how the live, you know, regular people to people in person thing happened. And what I realized is the modern day version of that is what we do on the internet. It's live streaming, it's making YouTube videos and interacting with other creators. In China, it's a little more complicated because the platforms are split, but it's fundamentally still the same thing. By interacting as people on the internet, we're doing the same work that we were doing in person. And so, uh, but online diplomacy has a little bit of a difference. What is the people to people online? Uh, well, the internet means that it's the democratization of diplomacy. Again, there used to be a time when we sent an ambassador and that person spoke for the country. And now as an American, I can take a cell phone and selfie myself and put that video up on the Chinese internet and people will believe me about what I say about the United States, because that's how people interact with people. I all of a sudden get to be in some ways uh, this, you know, this unofficial, but in many ways, even more official, more understandable ambassador than the actual ambassador. Um, it gives us the ability to scale. Uh, so, you know, you can do one ping pong event or a or hundred ping pong events, maybe, but you can't do a hundred million. Uh, but if you make one internet video, again, of that show is basically filmed with me selfied here on very little budget, zero dollars, uh, that can actually go out to hundreds of millions of people if you, if you know the internet. Uh, it also gives us the ability to collect real-time data on whether it's working or not. If we send a symphony orchestra over, uh, did it work? Did it not work? What, what does working mean? We have very little idea to figure it out. What the internet uh, does is it allows us to pick goals on what we want for targets, people interacting, shares, comments, a call to action like donating money or doing something, we can figure out whether our, whether our exchange is working. And the websites that help us do this, whether it's the Facebooks, the YouTubes, the TikToks, the Instagram, they are built to help us build community. They make more money when we have more people on the channel and more groups doing more things. So unlike a lot of times when it's difficult to build community in person, the internet is specifically functioning towards the purpose of building that community. Um, and then finally, the internet has one really weird thing that is very different from in-person is that computers are in control of everything we watch. So there used to be people who decide what videos go up. I think this one's good. I'm going to buy that TV show. Nowadays with the internet, computers control everything. This isn't necessarily good or bad, but it does mean that the results are skewed. So if your video does well, it can do really well and it can get out to a bajillion people. If it fails, it gets out to very few people. Um, similarly, if you do good things on the internet and people think well of our countries, uh, we can spread to a lot of people very quickly. If people do bad things on the internet and people think poorly of each other, uh, it can cause uh, tension very quickly. So um, a couple ideas that I had in terms of effective and responsible, I feel both aspects are important when we try to do um, when we try to do our uh, interaction. Obviously, we want to be responsible, but if we're not effective, then we're ceding the internet space to people that will make junky videos and cause strife. Um, so responsibility, I'm not going to lecture everybody on it in different areas. Every different organization is different. But I think on the internet, what you want is transparency and honesty. So when I did that charity show and raised money for Wuhan, I showed myself packing the items into the boxes. And it seems like a very basic thing, but it shows that connection with the audience that you're trying to show that what you say you're going to do, you actually do. And a lot of people, I'm sure, are doing fantastic things in the world, and it's just as basic as show your work. If you're really doing amazing things, uh, you know, Dr. Akuli was really connecting people across from Germany to South Carolina, show your work on the internet, and it doesn't have to be fancy.
A um, couple ideas on how to be effective. Uh, remember, the internet is symbiotic with what you're doing. It's not conflicting. People oftentimes, in, in my case, I said, oh, I want to be a stand-up comedian. I want to be on television. I want to be, I, I have a brand, right? Um, and I thought that it may be a problem to just go into my kitchen and start making silly videos about toilet paper. Um, as a comedian, I kind of get away with that a little bit more than other people. But the idea is that these things actually help each other. The internet video brought more people to an audience space that may wind up go seeing me live. And then the live audience will follow me and keep interacting with the internet videos. So it's really a case of one plus one equals three. Whatever you are already doing, you don't need to plan anything extra. Just start videoing it and putting it on the internet and you have a chance for that one plus one equals three things to happen. And then finally, remember that when you're doing things on the internet, um, you want to think about your interaction with your audience as a story, not an event. So my charity show, the story of that that my uh, audience saw uh, was a first a picture of this uh, poster that I put together for the event. And then I showed the actual performance video. And then I showed the video of me boxing up the, the, uh, the products uh, that we had bought, the face masks and everything and sending it to Wuhan. People commented that, hey, we want to see more comedy. So I put together another comedy video from the show. And then finally, this is where really the power of the people to people interaction comes to bear. When it got to March and April in the United States and we were in really bad shape and we needed masks, I made a video blog saying, hey, if you have masks and you can send them here, message me. And I got 150 private messages from fans who wanted to donate masks, who ran shipping companies, who uh, you know, knew how to be able to get them through customs, uh, all of these people working together to now help Americans get masks because they had seen an American help them when they were in need. And so these are the sort of downstream effects of using the internet that I never could have imagined. And in the end, we were able to get masks into homeless shelters in Boston uh, because of this bizarre comedy show that I put on and filmed on the internet. And then of course, because it's fun, I showed everybody how to make s'mores. <laughs> um, so I, I just think when it comes to people to people diplomacy online, remember, be the meme you want to see on your feed. You don't need to spend a ton of time editing. Think of the internet stuff you watch. A lot of it is not slickly produced. Uh, it's authentic people trying to make change in the world. And I think people really appreciate that. And finally, uh, in signing off, I just want to say thank you to everybody. And uh, thank you to the Fulbright Association support of the Fulbright Greater China program. If you don't know, uh, the Fulbright Greater China program has been canceled. There are going to be no more people like me coming down the pipe unless we are able to get the Biden administration to revoke the part of the executive order on the Hong Kong normalization uh, treaty and be able to restore the Fulbright Greater China program. Um, so I do want to thank the Fulbright Association for making that one of the action points uh, of our last cycle. And again, if anybody happens to know uh, President Biden and can tell him that specific sentence, you'd be great. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand it off uh, to the next person. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesse, um, for that great um, presentation. Hi, everybody. I am uh, Angel Ford. Uh, and I am going to start us off with our presentation uh, titled Celebrating the Legacy of Global Friendships. Much like uh, Jesse talked about, we're going we're gonna to build on that with our experiences of um, our cohort. I'm going to introduce the presentation, share a few pictures, and uh, talk a little bit about my own experiences. Um, but what we want to focus on today are those relationships and given the current world circumstances um, with, with COVID, like Jesse said, and the movement online, we'll talk a little bit about that, but also with our cohorts experience being in Ethiopia and the current relationship between our government and the government of Ethiopia with the tensions that are there, uh, we want to make sure we continue to nurture and grow the individual relationships that we have as a cohort, um, as our group, but also with those we worked with and um, built relationships with while we were in Ethiopia. So here's a picture of us uh, in our, uh, the first time that we all met, this is in Chicago in July of 2019, when we were in our training 
for, um, for our program before we actually went to the country. Um, here are a few pictures of us conducting workshops and seminars throughout the country. We were uh, able to travel to a number of universities and other locations. Uh, and when we worked together, we broadly talked about academic writing and publishing. We all are from very different fields. And so we would often do individual workshops or seminars um, on our individual topics, um, but also then we would come together and work uh, together to help in this very necessary area with academic writing and publishing. We did get the wonderful opportunity to attend a lot of different cultural events and to do some fun sightseeing. I just thought I would throw up a few pictures there to show you some of the fun that we had as we were building our relationships as a group, but also with others um, that we were connecting with during our time there. Um, and unfortunately, in March of 2020, like the rest of the world, we were affected by COVID-19. And we were currently, during that time, we were working at Haramaya University in Harar, Ethiopia. We were all there together uh, conducting a workshop. As you can see here from the title on this image, we were talking about grant writing, scholarly writing, and open access. It was at that time that the U.S. State Department uh, contacted each of us and let us know that the Fulbright would be um, suspended. So we, um, we had to change our plans and, um, and move on. But we have maintained our relationship as a group, as a cohort, and that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today because that is um, how we're taking forward even though we weren't, we weren't all still uh, remaining in Ethiopia to do our work. We have, like Jesse was saying, we have kind of moved online. Uh, a lot of our activities are done online. So I'm gonna talk for just a minute or two about some of the things that I did and how I'm continuing to nurture and maintain relationships with individuals in uh, Ethiopia. So I was at Addis Ababa University. Um, I was advising some doctoral students there. I have continued to advise the students online. I have been working with a couple of the students with uh, publications. I'm happy to report that one of the students has uh, recently been able to publish his dissertation. I've encouraged students to attend conferences, and I've been able to attend conferences online with my uh, advisees from Ethiopia. Uh, last week, one of my advisees from Addis Ababa University uh, won the Outstanding Dissertation Award from an International Education Planning uh, Society, which was a really neat event to be involved with, even though, again, I'm not there on the ground. I'm able to continue to uh, mentor and, and help. Um, so that was a great event for that student to be able to attend. I also have worked with Jimmy University while I was in Ethiopia. I taught a course there. I have returned to Ethiopia one time since, come, since uh, the end of the Fulbright and, and taught a course there as well. Continuing to reach out to individuals there um, and see if there's anything that I can assist with, whether it's reviewing documents online or having uh, virtual meetings. I'm also creating some online teachings um, and I'm working on some ongoing research. And I'm doing that in collaboration with um, some uh, individuals from my cohort, which you're gonna be hearing from in a moment, as well as from my colleagues there on the ground. We just feel it's, a very, it's very critical to maintain and nurture those relationships. And now I am going to pass along the presentation to Adis, and he is going to share about his experience. Okay, thank you, Angel. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be here to share my experience in Ethiopia, and I'm thankful for Fulbright to give us a chance to participate in this call, uh, especially serving with this group, uh, the connection we made during our initial orientation paid off. Uh, we we participate most of our activities together. Uh, my institute, host institute, was Addis Ababa Institute of Technology. Uh, it's a part of Addis Ababa University, the oldest school in Ethiopia, has 14 uh, campus, more than 48,000 students. 
uh, I start uh, teaching uh, at Addis Ababa Institute of Technology, and I also had a privilege to teach from Addis Ababa Science and Technology uh, this graduate program. Um, one of the things which I am proud of uh, accomplished during our, uh, our Fulbright program, I started establishing experimental soil mechanics laboratory from a generous gift of money from Corlett Solution. Uh, I brought a, 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 a system that can be used for undergraduate education as well as graduate research program. So I'm still continuing um, helping to establish that uh, laboratory. Uh, I also had a privilege of advising uh, smart master students. I had worked with three master students and one PhD student. I had also an opportunity to review PhD program in curriculum. Um, what unique about our court was that in many occasions we served together. Uh, we, get, we celebrated festivals, cultures together. Um, one of the example that we did four of us together was a grant writing and open access workshop uh, that was uh, uh, done in RMA University. Um, we are from diverse background and uh, we complement each other uh, in, in many ways. Um, we still are connected among ourselves and with our colleagues from different from the host university. I, I have added as adjunct professor. Um, I am still continuing research with PhD students. I'm writing a paper with the students. And um, more importantly, I'm hosting one uh, PhD students in my university as exchange students. Uh, he's working on uh, natural fibers, extractions. He doesn't have a, uh, facility to do his research work. So he got a chance to visit our university and he's doing his uh, research work. Uh, the other thing which I would like to share with you today is about my experience, especially in culture, uh, especially in communication. Um, understanding culture is important to understand people's perspective. I could not figure out why my advisor, when I was doing my PhD, was worried that I might not be uh, make it here in the US because of uh, the way I communicate. Uh, I intend to be shy and uh, prefer to be silent, but I didn't understand this behavior until I go back in Ethiopia after you know 15 years. Um, here I used to be somehow you know prefer to keep silent unless I need to talk. Um, I, I can understand how that people can interpret this. You know, people, they might perceive this is a lack of confidence or shyness or not able to speak. Uh, but back in Ethiopia, I found myself talking too much uh, to the level that I don't give a chance to others. And uh, um, so I figured out that the reason why uh, I, I was not talking or uh, not uh, seen as aggressive is not directly related to uh, the, the other uh, things that's listed here. Rather, it's purely related to the culture. And there are some cultures that prefer uh, the best way communication of is just being a silent or uh, prefer listening. So this, uh, my Fulbright experience actually uh, found uh, the, this cultural different that could be perceived by people uh, in different interpretations. So I think the role of Fulbright programs uh, in understanding culture cannot be understated and can be used this to you know, normalize the, the, the cultural issue that we we'll, we'll might face uh, during communication. Uh, having said that, I will pass this to uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, Tiara. Oops. Great. <laughs> Hello, thank you, Addison. Hi, my name is 
Dr. Tara Wilfong. And like Addis said, um, I was part of the cohort also. Um, I actually, I did my Fulbright at Haramaya University, which um, the other three did theirs in um, universities in Addis Ababa. So I was the only one that was actually outside of Addis. Um, Haramaya is an Eastern uh, part of Ethiopia. And I actually am still here. <laughs> um, I did leave for a short while uh, because of COVID, but then I was hired directly from Haramaya. So I'm uh, now working as an associate professor at Haramaya. And as you can see from the slide, I mean, I'm still doing uh, things. I'm supervising graduate students students, teaching classes, and doing capacity building and things. But I want to talk about things kind of like what Addis did. Um, I, I mean, our cohort, uh, we had, you know, we got along great. Um, we did a lot of things together. And I, I think that we were very fortunate with the, the group that we had. You know, we had two, two uh, people that were from Ethiopia. And um, for me, it really helped. I, I've worked in Ethiopia before before I came here, and but by having them and, and um, you know getting close with them and working closely with them, it really helped because um, it helped explain some of the culture. It's very different um, working in a country for a couple of months and then going back to the U.S. versus living here for a long period of time. Very very different. Um, so. It really helped having Addis and Daniel and helping understand some of the behaviors, some of the cultures, uh, especially with my students. So I really appreciated that. I'll never forget. There's a couple. Well, there's many, many things I appreciate. I mean, just our social interaction. I know for sure I have three friends for life. Um, but like I said, even understanding some of the behavior of my students, I remember when we were doing the grant writing class at Haramaya University, Addis was up front talking, I, I don't even remember what it was about right now, but just some of the behaviors and it, it was like a light bulb going on and just suddenly realizing, you know, some, some of the behaviors I was seeing and some of my students. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, we're talking about, um, uh, building relationships. And I, I really appreciate what Jesse said and um, what he shared and talking about online and building relationships. And I'm not sure if what the audience really knows everything that's going on in Ethiopia right now. And someone mentioned it just a, minute, a few minutes ago, kind of the relationship with the United States and Ethiopia. But just real quickly, um, the relationship with the United States and Ethiopia has drastically changed just in the few last few months. Um, it's sort of deteriorated um, for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons um, probably is our government and the way they've kind of dealt with some things, but also is online, social media, and um, the way uh, it, people are taking things wrong on social media um, and, and false news, false information on social media. And so I think this it, it this is a perfect opportunity for us <laughs> as Fulbrighters to really take our relationships that we've developed um, you know, while we were here and just as individuals, you know, take that as you just kind of talked about people to people diplomacy and and show that we're not <laughs> some of the things that they're saying on the uh, on social media and really develop those relationships um, and kind of continue, you know, improve the cultural diplomacy even after the Fulbright end. So um, I think that's, you know, as our cohort, that's really what we see as important is kind of continuing these activities and um, our relationships, not only within ourselves, but also uh, with the people at our, our institutions and other institutions. I mean, Daniel and Angel have worked with other, and, and Addis have worked with other universities um, to continue those uh, relationships. And I think that's really important, even if it's just one person at a time, you know, to, to, uh, to show and improve those cultural diplomacy. So. That's what we hope to continue to do even beyond our, our full right. So thank you. And I will turn it over to Daniel. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tara. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, uh, the actual academic activity is really great. You know, I can briefly mention what I did, but 
but the other untold story is even greater. And you know, we should we should emphasize on that as well. So to go quickly, uh, I was assigned at Addis Ababa University. Uh, by the way, I'm, I was originally from Ethiopia, and I used to work even for Addis Ababa University, you know, some twenty years ago. So returning back as Fulbrighter to Ethiopia and you know, serving the two institution I love, the two country I love, you know, it's an amazing opportunity for me. So I'm really, really grateful for the uh, Fulbright program. And <clears throat> when we were in Ethiopia, because we have great relationship across, you know, among our cohort, we were actually serving more universities, you know, beyond uh, the host institution. So immediately, you know, because we had good network already there, they know we were there. So they tried to take advantage of the time we were there. So we were able to visit number of, you know, government and private institutions. So we hosted so many uh, workshop and conferences based on the area uh, they want us to have. Usually it's an academic writing, grant writing, uh, open access and scholarly communication, uh, which, which really, you know, we can easily collaborate. So uh, <clears throat> in the process, uh, I get hooked to Juma University and they actually started a doctoral program in information science, but they were struggling to find uh, faculty members to help in some courses. So, you know, uh, Dr. Angel mentioned she, she's from education, so she helped in, uh, 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 in academic writing side. So, we went there a couple of times to teach different cohorts, uh, first year, second year group. And they honored me actually by giving honorary professorship for the next five years. So we still are in touch and I'm advising doctoral students uh, in their dissertation as well. And we also helped uh, them to link with you know, international conferences uh, based on their research area. So at least three students uh, presented their research in, in uh, prestigious conferences, digital library conference, international knowledge uh, management conference. So it needs continuing more are even on the pipeline. Uh, my personal area was in digital libraries and uh, digital curation. So I helped uh, some starting some uh, digitization projects. I also took some equipment for digitization equipment there. And our university started, <clears throat> they already have uh, ETD, electronic testing dissertation projects, but they didn't finish digitizing, um, going back retrospectively. So we identified a uh, uh, group of theses that are widely used, mostly used. So we develop a workflow so they can replicate for others. So we did that, and that's one. The other one is uh, government information. Uh, again, you know, there's a broad picture of you know, e-government initiatives. So having different nodes from different parts of the country helps to increase the digital access. So uh, fortunately, the parliament was in the process of you know, uh, uh, requesting proposal for digitization, their uh, parliamentary documents. The current one is digital. Everything now is digital, but the back documents was in paper form. So they requested proposal and Addis Ababa University submitted a proposal and we won. I was part of that proposal as advisor. So we won that project and Addis Ababa University is really working on digitizing government documents. So you know, that will add it to the national grid and it will you know, increase the access for the citizens. And the ongoing project, one of my personal uh, kind of research project was to start a digital library uh, in Africa. You know, there is the digital library conferences globally for Asia, for Europe, and the US one is international JCD joint conference on digital library, but there is nothing for Africa, which discuss issue in African context, because there are so many specific regions, specific issues that needs to be discussed and you know, even standards developed to help that group. So unfortunately our program interrupted because of COVID last year. So we didn't push because our plan was to do more in second semester, but I got another opportunity now. Uh, I will be hosted in South Africa now. So I hope to start a digital library conference soon. <clears throat> and I also have a, a little uh, book on scholarly communication. So that's part of the act actual activity. Regarding horizontal activity, like among ourselves, just the cohort, also kind of develop work relationship. 
So we we came from different background, but there is some common team we, we try to, to identify. So we present actually paper in, in each other's in community. Uh, for example, ICEP is entirely education. I never attended ICEP conference before because of my colleagues now. Uh, I attended a conference last three years and actually because of my involvement, they kind of able to bring you know, the information science aspects into their discipline. And this year, even the team was focused on, you know, uh, you know kind of open access, uh, adding open access in education and the benefit of open access in education. So it was covered wide uh, area of the, the team. And another conference as well, my ICKM, International Knowledge Organization Conference, Association of Information Science a Conference for my colleagues, those are new group for them, but they were able to attend that conference as well. So even among ourselves, it helped to promote interdisciplinarity. Uh, the lessons learned, I think, you know, even if I was originally from Africa, I still lost my African eye. You know, when I returned back, you know, we were spoiled here with the resources. So learning, you know, working in limited resource and those kind of things, not just giving, we also receive, we also learn so many things from our colleagues in Africa. Uh, I know we are out of time, so thank you. I will pass to the next speaker. I think Julia. <clears throat> yes, it'll be Julia next. Julia, are you uh, online? I am. I apologize. I'm getting um, the technology set. No worries. No worries. Go right ahead. All right, everyone. Is this? Can everyone see? You're just fine. Go for it. Wonderful. All right, so I wanted to start by saying thank you to the panelists um, for your interesting presentation so far and to the Fulbright for the opportunity to um, present with you all today. Um, I was an ETA in Laos uh, from 2016 to 2017. And last year when I began a master's, um, I was in anthropology, I wasn't able to do field work and turned to some of my friends and um, contacts from my time as an ETA in Laos. Um, to do my research for my master's. And so this presentation is um, a presentation of a few of the ideas um, just to test out from my master's research. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Let's get started. Um, so my presentation today is called Inspiring Changemakers, International Exchange and the Emergence of Youth Volunteerism in Lao PBR. And I am Julia Roberts, currently a first year PhD student in social anthropology at the University of Cambridge. So I would like to propose that a new youth movement is gaining popularity in the Lao People's Democratic Republic, or Laos. Let's see if I can, there we are. So volunteerism initiatives spearheaded by young people articulating the desire to quote, help their communities have proliferated over the last decade, emerging first in the urban capital of Vientiane, which you see on the map with the yellow star, and gradually expanding to the secondary population centers of Luang Prabang with the purple star in the north and Savannah Ket in the south. In the words of one of my interlocutors, Lee, a 22-year-old Lao national and volunteer, compared to the past, now the young generation is thinking more about the social problems. They want to be part of the solution. And so urban youth with the luxury of leisure are increasingly investing that time in service clubs and community projects targeting recently problematized social issues such as improper waste management, environmental degradation, school attrition, and rural poverty. Here are some of the logos of just a few of the youth-led initiatives I found who currently have active Facebook pages. In my interviews in English and on social media, these youth are deploying English terms such as volunteer, volunteerism, and community service to describe their actions. This nascent volunteerism is manifesting in activities like litter sweeps, blood drives, clothes drives, free English camps, and awareness raising projects about things they consider to be important social goods like hygiene and education. So Facebook, which is typically asked 
uh, excuse me, accessed through smartphones using pay-as-you-go internet data is the primary medium through which these groups are articulating their mission, recruiting volunteers, and promoting service opportunities. While most of these groups are not officially registered with the Lao government as NPAs, their projects are semi-formal um, and have you know, decent institutional structures with leadership teams. Um, they often maintain websites and email addresses, and some are even actively pursuing grant funding. And so with this observation, my first claim is that this form of apolitical collective community service is actually a new social trend and form of sociality for contemporary Laos, which is distinct from forms of mutual aid and community support, which were practiced in Laos um, previously before it, Laos began to open to marketization and globalization in the 80s. So crucially, this, this youth-led volunteerism is also evolving outside of the institutions of the communist state. For example, um, there's an organization called the Lao People's Revolutionary Youth Union um, for Lao youth to get involved in their communities, um, but this is a separate initiative. So what has been called neoliberal volunteerism and scholarship, um, such as these organizations I'm discussing, um, is characterized by the unsolicited provision of assistance, um, support for those beyond one's own proximate community, formal order and organization and service delivery, and the valorization of altruism. So with our time today, I want to pose, propose the question why. Why is Lao youth participation in formal volunteerism and youth-led community activism apparently on the rise? What are the causes and the motivations for this social change? What forces are influencing these youth? And so I will try to convince you that English language applications for competitive international scholarship and exchange programs have played a significant role in the emergence of youth volunteerism in Laos. So as I mentioned, my uh, research and my presentation today is based first upon 11 months working in Luang Prabang, Laos as an ETA with the Fulbright. It's also based on limited Facebook digital ethnography and just under 39 hours of semi-structured and group interview data. Um, and these interviews, which were conducted in English between January and July of this year, um, involved 18 Lao and foreign interlocutors with some of the key demographic information posted here. So to better understand what I mean by youth exchange and scholarship programs, let's consider what is perhaps the paragon of such programs in Laos, the prestigious Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, or YCE, which is an exchange to the US, which was established in 2015 by the Obama administration. YCLE purports to cultivate young leaders who can solve global challenges. It selects participants according to various criteria, including strong leadership and commitment to community service. Many Lao youth believe that programs like YCLE are the means by which they can achieve their dreams of economic mobility and international travel. So my research suggests that it is through engagement with these exchange and scholarship program applications that the idea of formal volunteering becomes a relevant moral concept and a compelling ethical practice for many Lao youth. Consider these following prompts taken from applications in English on, uh, that Lao youth have recently interacted with. How are you making an impact on the health and well being of young people in your community? So the, you know, these are application prompts. The youth are asked to respond to this and provide an essay. Estimate the number of people impacted by your actions. List your work and volunteer experiences. And how will your participation in this program help you make an impact on your community, country, or the ASEAN region? Successful applicants would likely answer these questions with responses detailing specific accounts of consistent community service, using prose that reflects a grasp of the sustainable development ideology and rhetoric. To prepare Lao youth to answer such questions and become competitive applicants, a system of preparatory training has actually developed in Laos. Information sessions provided for free by the US Embassy and foreign volunteers have actually become a regular occurrence. These sessions te teach tips and strategies for submitting successful English language exchange applications. This graphic is the core curriculum for one such course periodically offered by an education nonprofit in Long Prabang. If we zoom in on this uh, blue box here, um, 
we see that uh, the curriculum emphasizes giving back, volunteering, and helping others as crucial steps to becoming a competitive applicant. This matches my interview findings in which interlocutors repeatedly um, expressed that the ubiquitous advice for any prospective exchange applicant um, was to volunteer and to help the community. So I would therefore like to argue that these applications and the training systems uh, which have developed in response, uh, exemplified by this um, chart here, um, that these are all an influential force in the observable youth volunteerism trend in Laos. So most directly, this messaging that one must volunteer to become a competitive applicant has created an incentive that has shaped youth behavior and practice. But less overtly, these applications are having an impact on youth worldviews. Specifically, I suggest that the process, the intellectual engagement uh, with the application training and prompts, when they sit down to actually think through and write these essays, um, that this process is exposing our youth to the vocabulary of volunteerism and community service. And that due to the relative power and moral authority of the scholarship granting organizations, these words become compelling ideas with moral currency. So these applications are precipitating positive practices and it's contributing to both the individual and their community. But it must not be forgotten that this dynamic is the product of a global power hierarchy in which these youth are positioned beneath the scholarship admissions committees, which review their applications and determine their suitability. In many cases, the youth feel that they must mold themselves into the image of the ideal youth change maker as imagined by the gatekeeping organizations such as YCWI and those admissions committees in order to gain access to the life-changing opportunity of an educational ex exchange abroad. So before I conclude, I wish to clarify my argument in one crucial way. I emphasize that Lao youth activism and emergent volunteerism is not reducible to calculated self-interest. I'm not claiming that the sole or even the primary reason for youth volunteerism is to become a competitive exchange applicant. However, the incentive to volunteer and the moral currency placed on the act of community service through the mechanism of exchange and scholarship applications seems to me to be clearly influencing youth ideas and youth actions. So while the forces at work in Lao society, which are catalyzing this youth volunteerism trend are myriad, the stories of my interlocutors on the vanguard of this movement suggest that the international scholarship and exchange applications must be considered as an influential piece of the complex causal puzzle. The impact such programs may be having in creating youth change makers in Laos as well as around the world is a subject worthy of further investigation. So thank you so much for your time and attention. I just thought it would be best to read so I could get all of my ideas out. I'm new at the conferences, so I, I was a bit nervous. Um, I look forward to your, your thoughts on these ideas and your questions at the end. So I will stop sharing now, see if I can be better at this than I was at getting it going. Yeah, you can. Thank you uh, very much, Julia. And uh, if I could have everyone on this panel come back online um, with video, and uh, uh, I'd, I'd be grateful. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to moderate some questions here at the end of this fantastic panel. But uh, first, I want to congratulate everybody for getting our conference started on a terrific note uh, with, uh, with many interesting lessons and perspectives. Uh, this was a, a great panel, so I'm, 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 uh, I'm grateful to all of you. Uh, let's, let's do uh, questions sort of in, in order that we, that we had our presentation. So we'll start with Alex. Um, a question posed by Jay Nathan. Uh, how did you get started in this collaboration with between German high schoolers and those in, in South Carolina? What's the origin of, of that, that particular exchange program? How did it how did it get off the ground? Great, thank you for that question, Jay. Uh, when I began this work, what, three years, four years ago now, uh, I was um, taking advantage of the knowledge and the expertise that I've developed over the last 15 years, uh, creating and, and uh, sustaining exchange programs and partnerships around the world for universities. So I use that to, the, to extend uh, my support to the local high schools. So because of the challenge, as I mentioned in my presentation at, at the uh, K-12 uh, levels is lack of resources, lack of 
lack of expertise, not knowing where to start and uh, how to uh, harness the global networks that are all around the high schools. So uh, serving as uh, vice president for Sister Cities International in my uh, community at that time, and still am, um, through the relationships I had created, I reached out to the school superintendent uh, for district two at that time uh, and uh, proposed the idea with a draft uh, MOU, which he, in symbolic gesture of full enthusiasm, signed the draft right there, not because it was going to be official, but just to demonstrate his, his uh, commitment to it. Um, so what we did uh, was I used my global network of colleagues and the university uh, partnerships around the world, in this case, Germany, as the local resource in country, in this case, in Germany, in Bavaria, uh, to explore the interest at those local high schools for establishing sister school relationships with the high schools in my community. Um, so this served as a good starting point, uh, a low uh, stress uh, starter point for the high schools. And uh, they had the confidence that I knew what I was doing because I'd been doing that work for a number of years for the university. Uh, so that's how we began. And uh, we brought in local partners and our global partners. So right. in the case of our colleagues, Fulbright alumni in this, in this uh, uh, conference and elsewhere, I would recommend that if you do not have access to the international directors at your universities, uh, what we are doing currently, uh, since I'm not at the university, but I still have my global network, we are working with a high school in Charleston, South Carolina, um, who is, I mean, that is interested in establishing a sister school in Central America with Spanish language focus. Um, so we're using our, our Fulbright alumni network uh, in Panama in this case to understand what the interests and the needs of high schools in Panama might be uh, so that we can foster and, and encourage and support uh, schools, the school in South Carolina in Charleston, as well as the school in Panama or schools uh, to begin the conversation and guide them through the process of how to think through uh, the different questions, the different challenges, and the framework through which to develop the programs. Uh, and many professors, many Fulbright alumni, also uh, faculty program leaders for study abroad programs with students. So there's a lot of uh, cross learning that can be put to use to the benefit of the high schools. Right. So uh, I will pause there to give time to others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, our next uh, set of questions is for Jesse. Uh, Jesse, uh, uh, two questions. One is uh, how you overcame uh, the language barrier uh, for uh, doing comedy in China and for Chinese audiences. Uh, a very good question. A second one is is what what steps what next steps are are available to the people in the China and the U.S. to improve relationships between our countries. Um, you, you mentioned the cutoff of the program, but in the meantime, more ping pong? I mean, it, uh, it, this is a, a vital relationship. What do we do next? So the, the language barriers and what to do next for China. Sure. Well, big questions. Um, but the, the language is, uh, I think, a little bit easier. I studied abroad in China and I had a chance to actually live in China before I did my Fulbright. Um, but I think the key thing that for me, what in, in order to take over that language barrier was using kind of the mindset that we use for improv comedy in real life. So I did improv comedy where there's no script and there's no props and you just have to make everything up. And it turns out in life, you also have no script and no props and you just have to make everything up. And what we learn in improv is if you mess up, you mess up and you just keep going on and you get over that fear, uh, which is really what strangles people. It's that fear of messing up you know, spoiler alert, you're gonna mess up 10,000 times if you learn a language. You might as well kind of get into a whole bunch of new positions and start to experience it and not worry too much about that. <laughs> and, um, and approaching it with a sense of humor, uh, I think really helped me kind of break through that. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to mess up and you'll get those reps in before other people do. And um, when it comes to China, I mean, it's been a crazy year and a half for me watching everything kind of deteriorate from a 
international geopolitics perspective, while also simultaneously having my best year and a half ever of doing people to people relations. I think there's an, I think it's not a coincidence. I think as the politicians uh, get, uh, are unable to deal with the problems that regular people see in their lives, they become more interested in listening to regular people on the internet and hearing stories about how I as an individual with some stake in this challenge, I'm navigating the situation. Uh, and so I think that, you know, obviously at the end of the day, we will need our politicians to break through, but I like the internet and doing, um, you know, coming back to where that fun is, coming back to sharing real personal stories, doing that sort of work to remind everybody that we still have all these connections, whether or not you put a tariff on it, you know, I can still go and do jokes. Um, and even if occasionally I'm going to have a video blocked on the internet, you, you're not going to stop me from making all my videos. It just one video just goes off. And so if we're willing to deal with some of the um, sort of the mental tax of having the, uh, the uh, political situation be difficult, all of those tools of technology and intercultural uh, communication are still in our hands. And so I think, and, and, I, and I think the point of it again is not to say that we're going to have some magic television show that heals the world. What the point of the people to people does is that it puts us into an environment in which we can trust each other and solve the problem. Because if there was some amazing diplomat who solved the US-China problem today, no one would be ready to hear it. We're not ready to fix it. Nobody's in the mental space where they're ready to move on and get going. And the people to people is going to be the thing that reminds us, hey, we all enjoy living on this planet together. Um, why don't we figure out a way to like start enjoying it? more by figuring out those political problems. I appreciate that. And uh, that's probably one of the most cogent summaries of what public diplomacy is all about. So thank you, Jesse. Really, you. really appreciate that. Angel, a question for, for you. You mentioned that your cohort represents many different disciplines. I wonder how we might better take advantage of the uh, intellectual diversity in our community. Uh, uh, your, your example from this cohort that continues from Ethiopia is a great model, but is there something you can say to us in this very complicated Fulbright community about how cross-disciplinary conversation might benefit us? Sure. Uh, so I come from an education background. So I'm uh, curriculum development, educational leadership. Um, I have a unique perspective in that I'm, I was a prior military, so I also brought that perspective into some of the conversations that we would have. But learning about the different disciplines, so in our cohort, we have um, Dr. Wolfong, who is a medical doctor but, and works in public health. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kadane, or I'm sorry, Addis, I'm just going to say Addis because now I realize I've been saying his name wrong, um, works in uh, engineering, mechanical engineering, and um, Daniel works in uh, information uh, sciences, in um, library and information science. We learned a lot about each other's uh, disciplines. And so when I hear things about these different disciplines, my ears actually perk up now and I think about ways that we can connect each other. I had someone approach me about a um, helping with a book, a book that I, it was really outside of my expertise. He just needed someone with a connection to Africa. The publishers were uh, demanding that, but it really fit in with uh, Tara's research. So I emailed her and I said, hey, here's this opportunity. Uh, there was a, a time when Aris, um, there was a group he was working with that they, they wanted to hear some more about um, something I was working on. So he helped set up a, a seminar for me to talk about uh, cultural proficiency in, in classrooms. And so we, we purposefully pay attention to what each other are doing. We learn about what, what we're doing. We, we actually work some projects together. Um, Tara has a possible project in the future that would need some curriculum for, for children. And so we're, we're going to have this ongoing conversation. Um, it, it really depends on the, the disciplines and how they fit together, but there's so many ways that disciplines do. Uh, Daniel and I, uh, we've presented quite a bit together about this idea of open access. 
he's coming at it from the knowledge management uh, information science aspect, and I'm coming at it from an equity aspect. Uh, in the education realm. If educators can't access what they need to, and if students can't access what they need, uh, it's, an, it's an equity issue. So we've seen these merging of our disciplines in a way that I don't think will stop. And I don't think, I think I will always view other disciplines differently based on this experience. Hopefully I've answered your question a little no, you, bit. No, you have. And in fact, as a, an alumni organization, we want to encourage and support that kind of connection among cohorts, uh, among those who experience a particular country like Ethiopia. Um, please uh, allow us to, to, um, to help you as you would like to do that. Um, we're always open to suggestion. We're starting new interest groups. Uh, and we, we look forward to uh, connecting anybody who is on this presentation uh, to, to sort of follow uh, this, this group's inspiration. Adis, I, I have a question for you um, about Ethiopia. Um, how can we as a Fulbright community better understand Ethiopia itself? I mean, you, you spoke about the challenge of a, a modesty and a sort of silence that's a cultural norm in your country. Um, but uh, how, how can you overcome that? And those of us who know little about Ethiopia, how can we overcome our ignorance to, to better understand each other? What do you think are next steps here? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. Um, this might be also, uh, could be answered by Tiara, which is experiencing uh, right, right now. Uh, yeah. I, I think, uh, after you know this my experience, I also try to read other cultures. Uh, Japanese have a similar culture where they prefer silent, and how that created actually problem with the business and with the US. Uh, so uh, again, as uh, JC said, maybe this is possible only by people to people interaction, by giving more time and understanding and uh, their perspective. Uh, I don't think we can learn from the social media. Uh, there is only few people are connected to the internet and we hear from only few individuals. But if you wanna learn, go down to the ordinary people and try to understand how they see it and how they communicate. And this could be solved again by people to people interaction and giving more time to learn the culture and, and Tara maybe you could add. I, I, I would offer a, a quick pitch out us uh, to, to the programming we do around advocacy to the US Congress because uh, people to people uh, exchanges are, are really mostly possible with, uh, with travel. Um, Jesse's made an excellent point that uh, internet, the internet has fostered many great relationships but that people-to-people -people contact uh, costs money, and we need Congress's support to get more money to uh, to uh, to devoted to the Fulbright. Let me let me turn to Tara with a question that, that's about understanding. It's it you mentioned that you're outside Ethiopia's main city. Um, how is it that we can better understand a country's lesser-known region or areas, uh, particularly rural areas? I spent a lot of my time as a Fulbrighter in rural India. Um, uh, these are parts of the country that most people don't know anything about. How, how, how can we advance that part of better understanding a, a country like Ethiopia? That, that's actually a very good question because sometimes I feel like being in the, the rural area, it's not rural, urban, whatever, but outside of the capital, right. even, even Ethiopians sometimes feel like I'm you know, they, they don't even understand living out here sometimes. And it's almost like we're a little bit forgotten about because we're not in the big city. Um, so I, I think encouraging, you know, putting Fulbrights not just in the big city would be right. one thing. Um, uh, you know, Ethiopia has had some security issues and um, things like that. So I think they, t I don't know if that's the reason, but a lot of people are put into the bigger city areas. I know um, Dr. Angel was initially going to be in another city, but then ended up getting trans put into um, Addis Ababa. Um, but, 
you know, I, I really wanted to be here. Um, I did not want to be in a bigger city. I, I wanted to be at Haramaya, but um, because of the culture mainly. Um, but so I think that that's important is to try, really try to make sure that there's, you know, the, the Fulbright and um, are spread out throughout the country, um, I think is important. And also that we're able to travel around, which uh, the other three, the Fulbrights were able to travel around. Actually, <laughs> Angel and Daniel traveled more. They went to places that I wouldn't even <laughs> have gone to on some places, but um, they were able to travel. But we were restricted um, because there was a lot of um, uh, instability in the country the first year. So we we were restricted in somewhat. But it, I think that it, is very important, it. like what you said, that that is important to understand. It's very, very different living here versus um, in the big city. <laughs> I'm very, very sure of that. Uh, uh, Dan, would chime in on that. I yeah, think please that, go ahead, uh, Jesse. Uh -huh. uh, like if anybody knows the uh, Chinese woman Li Ziqi, um, Li Ziqi is a huge uh, internet influencer. She has 20 million fans or something like that on YouTube outside of China, and she makes videos about rural life in China. Um, mm -hmm. People who live in the cities love watching internet videos of people who live in places that are not cities. And so it's actually a huge opportunity, even really basic stuff. You don't need to be having 20 million fans, but there is an interest for even really basic stuff about lifestyle in other places. Um, and again, once you start making the type of videos that the internet likes, that can go around to 10 million people overnight. Um, even if it's just a question of like, how do we refill our water? Um, what's a school look like here? Um, the people are naturally curious about that and uh, it would never be economically profitable to send a film crew to rural Ethiopia, but it's definitely possible for people to be able to take out their phone and just, just you know, shoot something. So the Jesse, opportunities are there and they don't necessarily even cost money if you're already there. A fantastic suggestion. Jesse, I wonder if in the chat you could, you could put a link to that that person's uh, YouTube channel that you were just referring to, even if we can't understand the language, it would be fantastic to see. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with you. There are so many resources that we can share and uh, and uh, and uh, explore. Um, a question for Daniel. Daniel, um, uh, if you could come back on um, <laughs> video, there we yeah, go. Wait. The video is for some reason uh, well, not to, by not you. One of you. <laughs> Not to worry, we can hear you just okay. just fine. Uh, you were talking about um, cross co uh, continental research and how yes. digital digital conferences <clears throat> can promote that kind of uh, cross cultural and cross continental sharing. I wonder if, uh, in what ways could we, uh, either as a community or we as an association, could help support and expand those kinds of opportunities? I mean, how how do we how do we move forward here? Indeed, <clears throat> you know, the pandemic actually amplified the need of that kind of resources. You know, when I was there before the pandemic versus after the pandemic, you know, the air, the administration, the university administration even changed the way they see the value of having digital contents because of the online push, because online education was not that prevalent before the pandemic. Right after the pandemic, they just shifted without preparation. There is no resource, you know, students were accessing. Actually, I taught one course online. I was scheduled to teach in spring. All of a sudden, everything interrupted. I moved my content to online. So what, that was one of the first fully online classes at Addis Ababa University. And most of the students, they just have only phone. They just, so they were using just phone to access the whole thing. But, but after that semester, things change. But the key point here is having content digitally. So right after that, you know, the university put more resources to convert, to digitize, to put things online. So now the, almost the whole Africa, they have better understanding, better value of digital content. The time is ripe. So now actually I have opportunity to go back again. So, you know, I, South African is really, they are very interested to host the very first digital library conference, hopefully the right post, post Corona. We are planning in two years. So I think the time is right and the value is all understanding by, you know, first administration. So I, I hope I'm, I'm, you know, I'm right, right place, right time. And the time is really perfect. So it I'm grateful, you know, well, already I, the I think you're, I think you're right. It is, it seems to me ironic that the pandemic, which basically robbed most of us from the physical exchange of traveling, 
has presented us opportunities to use these digital tools to really advance and expand the mission. I think all of you have, have really spoken to, to this and that's sort of a surprise theme running through uh, all, of, all of these conversations and I'm grateful for that. I, I wanna turn to, to Julia um, and then we're gonna do a kind of an open question. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that are directed at everyone and we'll, people can just uh, kind of do a free for all. But let me uh, uh, ask a question of Julia. Julia, first of all, congratulations on your research. It's, it's very important work. Um, it's also focused on a country that, like Ethiopia, I, I hate to say it, but very few Americans are paying any attention to Laos. Um, and so your work is, is very important in raising the profile, both of the country and of its uh, idealistic and hardworking youth. My question to you is, um, is that your, your findings suggest there's real hope among uh, uh, young Laotians and young Asians generally in the future uh, do you have a call for action for us? Um, you, you've suggested that um, uh, international exchanges uh, and their application are something of an inspiration for this, but how can we support these young people? Is there, is there anything you would suggest that we could take concrete action? Donation, engagement, anything? Thank you so much for your question. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think it's extremely important to well, it's very unfortunate that more Americans aren't familiar with Laos because our actions during the Vietnam War actually continued to leave a mark. Um, it's one of the highest per capita bombed countries in the world, and that's the legacy of US action there. Uh, President Obama drew attention to that when he visited. But um, I think, yes, the, the youth there have this hope, this, this fire to that just inspired me as, you know, the daily struggles, we just seem to lose track of, of the hope in life. And I think they, they set that um, in my belly, um, learning from them. But as far as how we can help, I mean, I think um, donations, of course, being, um, they have their own projects that they want to do. They see the need, they know what needs to be done. They just lack the resources and they're, um, they're working to connect the, you know, the, the resources abroad channeled through these youth and their projects um, to the field that they see. So I think just being an informed consumer, um, especially as Americans being aware of what, um, what we owe these, these people and, um, and taking action through, through money, through awareness, if we, if we can't do anything else um, and believing in them that they have what it takes and they have the, the passion um, to support them with our, with our knowledge, yeah. My, my um, suggestion, thank you. My suggestion is that uh, any of you, in fact, anyone listening uh, in this presentation, if there are international development um, groups or if there are important educational groups overseas that you think would benefit from our support or donations, please uh, forward that information to info at fulbright.org, info at fulbright.org, which is our general email address here at the Fulbright Association. Uh, we'd be happy to share those things in our newsletters and um, um, uh, social media and other platforms uh, so that uh, groups like uh, what you're talking about, all those amazing young, young people can get the support they deserve. Uh, we have uh, only a, uh, a few minutes left, but I, I wanna note as an administrator, the astonishing fact that no one has dropped from this, this call. We have been online for an hour and a half and everybody's still here, which is really, <laughs> which is really great. A great tribute to, to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, the general question I'd open and throw it open for the few minutes that we have left comes from Catherine, who is asking about high schoolers who are looking for inspiration and direction and um, preparation for the kinds of experiences all of you have outlined, if you were to offer some advice to a, a young um, a budding internationalist, a, a high schooler like the kinds of folks that Alex works with, what would you say to them right now to, to get ready for a life of the international or to prepare um, for the kind of work that you have done? Happy to anybody raise their hand and offer some quick advice to those folks. Let's start with Alex. Thank you, John. That's a great question. I, I wanted to quickly mention that I did a lecture at 
University of Michigan uh, about a week or two ago. And these are freshman students who are exploring that very same question. So my advice to them was, and remains, that intentional networking and outreach through what I call global engagement or international engagement uh, careers is a good place to start because it connects the students and their ideas with uh, colleagues like us who have years of experience building these global networks with organizations and individuals across industries and across disciplines to connect them with opportunities and uh, bring their ideas to the mainstream in the places where they want to make an impact. That was my advice to them. That is the advice I give today. Right. And I want to congratulate Daniel for the work you're doing because it uh, reminded me uh, of the work that I'm doing with my daughter in Albania, uh, serving, uh, educating women and girls in rural uh, parts of Western Balkans uh, through virtual online education, which was an anomaly uh, before COVID. And uh, we are also working with local schools in those regions to establish virtual digital libraries. So thank you for bringing that to our attention, Daniel. We'll go next to Julia. Go ahead, Julia. What advice might you give young folks? Yeah, my first uh, time abroad was in high school to Germany um, from Boone, North Carolina, and it didn't stop after that. And it is my entire life has been shaped by now by that international, the drive to connect abroad. And so I think as we've seen COVID um, maybe and, and various rhetorics um, at the national level sort of maybe make us fearful of what's abroad, just um, help those young people just go for it. Just don't overthink, just be, be brave, courageous and adventure and growth and discovery awaits for you. So I, um, I hope they can overcome that fear and just dive in because they will, their lives will be changed because of it. I challenge any, any panelist to do better than that answer, but uh, um, I, I welcome it. Uh, any final word uh, from, from anyone who wants, uh, uh, Jesse, you wanna say something? I'll, Go I'll ahead. just chime in. I'd say, you know, ask for help. Um, people are there to help you. I, I um, was amazed that when I was applying for Fulbright, how, you know, generous other Fulbrighters were about sharing about their experiences of applying. Um, you know, if you ask five people for help, two or three of them are going to get back to you. And one of them might tell you exactly what you need in order to figure out how to do it. And uh, it gets you feedback and feedback is always good. Great, great. Well, uh, I'll leave that as, as the final word. And actually, as a footnote, the number of people who've come online have actually increased in the last five minutes. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a great thing. Um, I will turn this over to my uh, colleague Munir um, to talk about what's happening next. But before I do that, I want to thank all of you, Angie, uh, Juliet, Alex, Tara, Jesse, Otis, and Daniel. Uh, a great, great opening to our conference. Thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to many more panels like this. Okay, Monir, take you, it away. John, Thank you, John, for facilitating. Thank oh, you. Oh, my, my pleasure. My pleasure and honor. Thank you.